Good afternoon, everyone. This just came out yesterday. It's done by a New York um, organ New York based organization. We're having a global campaign to bring down the price of pneumonia vaccine to five dollars. So we are pushing the actually they asked me without telling me. So the interview be for one hour and so on and then just ran my life. And then they just out of two hours interview, they just got this one for the campaign globally and sent it to uh, through social media, thought leader in global public health. And the objective of this is done with MSF, Doctors Without Borders, to uh, the, to sign the petition for the next day better.com a fair shot to drop the price of pneumonia vaccine in um, globally and in the Philippines. So this kind of things it happens to you because you're thought to be a thought leader in global public health. You have to have responsibility whenever you make these statements. If you want to work for a pharma company, don't say these statements because you're dead. You will never be hired. So these are the things that I do in life every now and then. And endorsing products, endorsing campaigns, endorsing whatever. Next time I want to endorse condoms. I'm an HIV AIDS specialist. So um, that's uh, just for the start of what I do. This just re uh, came out yesterday. And we discuss global epidemiology for this afternoon. And we will relate it to pharmacy, to uh, medicines and drugs, and to global health. What is the population of the world? 7.4 billion. The biggest population is? China. Followed by? India. What's the largest country in Southeast Asia? Indonesia. What's the largest Muslim country in the world? Of course not. It's Indonesia. What's the largest um, Catholic country in Asia? Philippines. What? How many Catholic countries are there in Asia? One. Which is? No, you're wrong. There are two. What's the second country? East the more, very good. The more listed. Okay. Why do we have to discuss the global population? Let's look at this uh, table. Ten most populous country. There's Indonesia, before USA, Brazil, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Russia, and Japan. Let's follow this median age. The median age. Who is the? What is the youngest country? Nigeria. So it shows our population are young. What is the oldest country? Japan. What is the percentage of those who are aged 60 and above? Japan, 33% of the total population. And followed by USA. Russia. What does it show? What is this concept? Aging. Aging society. Aging of the population. Okay. Fertility rate. Nigeria. So it coincides with the median age. And then you have density. Urban population. Where do most people live? In Japan? Urban areas. So basically the world is urbanizing. The world is aging. Give me implications of it to far the pharmaceutical world. What diseases will come out with an aging population? Very good. Non-communicable diseases, which are cancer, cardiovascular, obesity, diabetes. What does it imply? for the pharma industry. Sales of medicines for NCDs. Once a person is diabetic, 
he has to take the medicine for the rest of his life. He will take it every day. If the person starts to be diabetic at 40 and aging goes high to 90, how many years will he take the medicine? 90 minus 40 is 50. Multiply it by the number of days. How much will a company earn just from one person? A lot. If you are a pharma company, therefore, where will you invest your money? Non-communicable diseases. Because if it's an infectious disease, if it's malaria, how many times do you give a malaria drug to kill the malaria parasite? A few doses, whatever you call it, it's done. How much will a company earn from it? Very, very less. That is the reason why there are more advancements in NCDs, in, in drugs against NCDs, because it will be lucrative for the shareholders of the pharma company. So they're based on, and that is the reason why there will be neglected tropical diseases. That's why it's called neglected, which we'll have a lecture on that later on, because of these reasons. I won't preempt the lecture. Okay, density. We talked about density and urbanization. When you say, let's go back to the slide. Urban population are now living in urban areas. What are the diseases that come out from urbanization? By the way, China is one of the, the there's just a new report on, what is diabetes or obesity? China is on the second largest, uh, most of these. But of course, you think of them as small. No, it's not. They're getting bigger relative to their size. So China is a very big uh, market for NCDs. Urbanization. What are the diseases that would come out from urbanization? When we say urbanization, they go from rural areas to the urban areas. What are the diseases that come out? Lung cancer. So that's form of cancer. What else? What? Mental. Mental. Stress. Okay, very good. Skin diseases. HIV. Why HIV? <laughs> Essay question, five points. Why HIV? Because, I guess. That's okay, the way you explain. There's no right or wrong answer. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, three points out of five. <laughs> By the way, Philippines now is in the red light of all countries in the world. There are five countries in red with HIV. Philippines is one of them. Watch out, it will explode if it's not controlled. That's a major problem. I'm a, my first job after med school was in the HIV AIDS programs in the Philippines. Okay, urbanization, change in lifestyle. Instead of cooking at home, having gardens, it's all buildings, where do people eat? Fast foods. Fast foods normally are oily, fast, salty, sugary. What would that be translate to? Non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular diseases. So the increase in urbanization of different countries translate also into NCDs. How do you prove it? It's easy. Check, for example, urbanization of Davao as your case study. Look at the areas of which were urbanized across 10 years. Correlate it with the increase of the NCDs in that city. You will come up with a good table that there are positive relationships. As one increases, the other increases, proving the point that urban urbanization <clears throat> increases. So these are good papers with these kind of things. Okay. So that's about the demography. 
most dense also would increase what kind of diseases? <coughs> Tuberculosis, <coughs> because of density. <coughs> so there are many deaths, but there are many births. Well, actually, they're both going down uh, globally. Now, see this graph. Supposedly, the population was projected to go this way. Eventually, it went this way. And in fact, um, the, the, this is the actual that's happening now. It's going up. These are just the projections of the world population. Why do you think is it going this way for the medium um, <clears throat> for the medium projection? <clears throat> in Europe, the population is now pyramidal or inverted pyramid. You know what a pyramid is, which means the base of the population is big, but an inverted pyramid aging population are higher than the small one. You know the. Inverted. So it's now aging, fewer births. What are the reasons for this? They're not interested in having children. So there's no more workforce. They are aging. What increased the life expectancy of populations? What, the, what, the, what um, increased the life expectancy of populations? Why do you think our lives prolonged? Healthy living. Lifestyle. Agree? Yes. Ah, very good. One reason is medicines and health technology. Vaccinations, medicines, drugs. What else? What is the major reason why were there's a shift from um, life expectancy? Because of What would make our lives longer? So you have medicines, it's because of public health advancement. Clean water, sanitation, and so on and so forth. Okay, we'll just jump into the... These are just some facts which you will get, like life expectancy is now 70 years. So these are higher life expectancy and lower life expectancy. Do you see the distribution? Rip, what country is this? America. Canada. Canada. This is? You know, if you're a global specialist, you can already memorize the countries. This is Australia, and this is Europe. So you have Italy, Spain, France, United Kingdom, Iceland, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Finland, etc., etc. Guess who are who lives longer? Who are the poorer country? Oh, which countries live shorter? What do you call this region? It's, this region is specifically called Sub-Saharan Africa. It's below the Sahara. And these are the ones who live shortest. And this is India. What's this region? Pakistan. Pakistan. What's this region? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. So why is their life expectancy low? Because of war, war and conflict. Japan is high life expectancy. Now, my question. Do you see a pattern in the life expectancy per country? Who lives longer, the rich or the poor? The rich. The rich. Philippines is somewhere in the middle, so it's getting better. So there's a high correlation. Life expectancy gets higher when the country becomes richer. However, when the country lives longer, NCDs will increase. Why do NCDs increase at the latter part of life? 
I changed my question. Can someone die without any disease? You have a critical care doctor here. Can someone die without any disease? Does ever okay? Change again the question. Does everyone die? Yes. We have life expectancy, correct? Until what age do you want to live? One hundred. Until what age? 18. What until what age do you want to live? 18? Until what age do you want to live? 100. Okay. How about you there? Until what age do you want to live? 18. 18. <laughs> Sir, until what age do you want to live? 7. You're just the life expectancy of Why 100? Why do you want to live until 100? Nothing, no reason. Why 70? Because after that, the human body is prone to many diseases and uh, like weak enough. So human body is prone to many diseases. Do you agree? Yes. So everyone dies. So that's our first conclusion. Until when can someone live? What is that age? We are statisticians here. There's always a specific number. Fifty sixty. Fifty sixty. Fifty sixty. To die? <laughs> to live. To live. Uh oh, yeah, you also die. You don't live, you die. <laughs> okay. Why do people die out? Can people die out of nothing? I say I want to live until 70, for 70 years. Tomorrow I sleep, I'm 69 years old today and 350 uh, days. Tomorrow I'm, I'm 70. I will sleep and I will not wake up. Is that possible? No. Why not? Okay, let's not talk about that here. <laughs> We're not uh, in a Miss Universe competition. Can someone live without that? Can someone die without any cause? Let me stop breathing and go to that tomorrow at 70. No, Alright, go to that tomorrow 100. Every death is a cause. Agree? Every death has a cause? Yes. There's no reason for that. Accept it. Okay, I'm just trying to play with your brain. That's why we're talking about um, epidemiology and... Okay, I'm going to give you evidence that... In the years before, this was the life expectancy. As we went through time, life expectancy went higher. There was a dip of life expectancy here because of this global. What is this? The war. Okay. We were able as a world to increase life. My question is, can we increase this further? That's so why they asked the question, can we live longer? Yes. Yes. Now you change your mind. You don't want to be 70 anymore. That's what I do as a lecturer. I keep on changing your mind so that when you go out, you get confused. <laughs> then you have to attend again the course. Okay. <laughs> Ask this to your students. They will go crazy. Okay. Can we increase this? Yes. Until what age? <laughs> when is that age? We use that with double H O. That is why we got, I'm sure you have, you, you have heard of the word Dallas. Disability adjusted life years. We start with the end and count the diseases that will make life shorter. 
That's why you call it disability adjusted life years. There's a specific number. You said we can increase it. Agreed, right? I provided you evidence that we increase it over time. Can I increase it further? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Until when? Let's not talk about God. He's listening now. He might strike us. Until when? You are health practitioners. What is your goal in life as your vocation? To prolong life. To make life. Why do you make life healthier? You prolong it. This is what we have been doing in the field of health and medicine. But yet, you only want to live until 70, when in fact it's already increasing. Who lives longest among women in the world? Japanese. Who lives longest among men? It's Iceland. One of those. Iceland or Japan. Okay. Why did this increase? You mentioned it. It's because of medicines and improved public health. <coughs> I next ask the question, can this just end somewhere and person falls without any cause? You said no, so you're not a health expert. Guess what? Look, we push it up, 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 up. Can we push it further? This is what you call there's a theory that says we are actually just pushing all the diseases to the end. Then there's always a disease that would cause. So that's why there's an accumulation of disease at the end. There are many theories on this, but we need evidence on these things. So now, I'm sure this is the first time you've heard of this. This is how you provoke when you speak in conferences. These kind of questions. Because that's how you change the paradigm of public health or global health. Because if we just Go to the internet and follow what you see, then you're actually not introducing something new to uh, global discussions. We increased life 2.5 years per decade. Look at what we mentioned earlier. Rich countries live longer than poor countries. It's because of what? What, poor, what do rich countries have? What is resources, basically? What would have a good quality health? How do you measure wealth? Simple. Money. Cash. To make human capital, what do you give to the human beings? Cash. To build a hospital, what do you make the hospital? Does it fall from heaven? No. You build it with cash. Oh my god, you attended a business lecture. <laughs> because we have evidence that wealth increases life expectancy, correct? Okay. I know it's bad listening to cash. It's all about cash, capitalism. But what else is there? Because that's how we molded the world. Give me a new social experiment that will change our paradigm. Take out cash. If you can introduce the world, then you will win a Nobel Prize. Because this is what the thinkers need. People who can think hard of the, of the society, introduce it, and let us experiment on that. As I mentioned, there are only two very big experiments. Communism and capitalism. So all business schools would teach capitalism, competition, etc., etc., choice. And communism, Marx and Engels started it, they implemented it, it was a big war, people got killed, but eventually communism died. Now going back to the communist socialist paradigm, is China a communist country? Yes, because they have a communist party. Agree? Therefore they are communists. So therefore all the services are free. They are not capitalists. Because communism and capitalism should not exist. Agree with your statement that China is a communist country? 
Who produces all your things? Your laptops, your iPods, which you buy? China, and you call it communist? They work in a capitalist system. So would you call it communist? It's a communist country because they have a communist party. But it has nothing to do with communism because they're highly capitalist. Now they say, let's combine communism and socialism. How do you combine the two? Provide services to the people for free, socialism, but make shitloads of money and use that to provide services to the people, capitalism. They coexist. Mm. We will go back to this discussion on these issues because of neglected tropical diseases. How can a pharma company survive? How will the rest of the diseases of the world, such as, why is there no HIV AIDS drug yet? Why, is there a treatment for HIV? Yes, okay. uh, ARVs. Yes. Is it a treatment? No. It just lowers the viral load so that the virus will be low. But it does not totally erase, delete all the viruses. Why can we, think, how, why can we not have a treatment for HIV? So the, the reason for that, sir, the, the increase of HIV is different from the reason for the increase in tuberculosis. The reason for that tuberculosis is the increase of, of drug resistance, for example. And the determinants are different because of the of many issues. Okay, HIV AIDS drugs. Why is there no treatment yet? Because the virus is smart? Yes or no? If we put in more money, can we find a treatment? Yes. But if you're a pharma company, will you start focusing on HIV AIDS? Why not no? Why, why no? Once you treat someone with HIV and gets no HIV, no more. That's it. Who are the HIV patients? Where are they from? That's why we have to learn global epidemiology. Poor countries who cannot afford to buy the drug. As compared to your NCDs, which are the rich countries who can afford to keep on buying the drugs. Correct? So those are the political and social determinants of drug policy globally especially with putting in capitalism and also putting in the paradigm of income, shareholders, and so on and so forth. I have a question. Yes. Currently, the outbreak of Zika virus. So why they are making vaccine? Why didn't they are few people that they are not investing in these things and they invested in Zika virus vaccine? Why Zika virus? I'm like I mean, I mean, why, why are they putting in money for the vaccine now? Yeah, why not for HIV? Why are they thinking for it? And... Good question. And why only Zika and HIV? Yeah, just for example. example yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. You can get it in many other things. Because it's something at the moment in fashion. So everyone clamors for it. So therefore, governments are pushed to put in money. But no drug company would be investing on that. Look at who are the ones putting in money for the Zika virus um, uh, discovery. It's governments, not the pharma companies. And this is so Yeah, yeah, partly. But where do they get the money? They use the laboratory of Sanofi and so on and so forth, but it's not a big investment. It still is the governments to place money on that. But governments are not there to make business. Because remember, the shift from capitalism, the shift from socialism to capitalism shifted the, the focus of earning money from this from this thing. So yeah, for the Zika virus, it's not the it's not the private company who's putting a lot of money. It is the government. So they are funding them. Yes, for the discovery of fast. 
But HIV should still be there. Okay, there's a lot of money, but it has a lot of importance for now. But suppose a company have produced a drug for Zika or something else. Okay. And they use it, and after some time, this virus is finished. Hmm. So it's a big loss because they have invest a lot on this product in terms of sales and these things. So, isn't it a loss to them? Who? To the pharma company because they have uh, used their researchers and everything and they have made it. You think they are investing a lot in Zika virus? I don't think so. That's the reason why, that's why it comes from the governments, the funding, because of the pressure of the states. Not because, so, in, in thinking of global health, you think about the dynamics of the different stakeholders, of the different players. It's the same thing with Ebola. Did they come up with a vaccine during the epidemic? No. Until now, they're still discovering. What's the problem with dengue now? In Southeast Asia, they're pushing for the dengue vaccine in. Where's the first trial being done in Southeast Asia? Philippines. How many strains are there for the dengue? And what is the dengue strain that they are attacking different from the vaccine that they are developing? That will be an interesting, you follow the discussion. So anyway, as you see, cardiovascular diseases is going down. This is the um, a standardized death rate. Why is it going down? If we said that, uh, why, uh, why, is the, why is the rate going down in terms of death across time? Better management. Technology, because we actually are just prolonging lives. So they will all die here, but we are just prolonging it. So public health is one of the reasons, the revolution. So who is this guy? John Snow in London. So they just took out the pump handle and then eventually there was no, what, what, um, it was the cholera. And of course, diagnostics, vaccines, and drugs were the major reasons for the improvement of life expectancy. So we were able, what was the first disease that we were able to uh, control, eradicate totally in the world? Very good. Smallpox. My next question. What is the next candidate disease that can be eradicated in the world? Polio. Do you agree? You agree? Okay. From Pakistan. The WHO came up with a press conference. Tomorrow we will now eradicate globally Polio. Yeah. What happened a few days after when they made that big announcement? Cases, Cases started to come out that slapped the WHO of their evidence. Where did the cases come out? In? in? The province which is itself of Afghanistan. Very good. It was in Afghanistan. Yes. Why was it there in Afghanistan and Pakistan that polio cases started to come out when the world said, we are going to eradicate polio? What was the reason? Which relates to my next statement. What happens during the, by the way, who is the major funder for polio vaccinations in the world? An organization. No. No. It's an organization which you know which you have in every city. It's the Rotary Club. Rotary Club is one of the biggest global funders of the polio program of the world. That's why there's a polio immunization day run by every Rotary Club once a year. So they put a lot of money in it. Okay, let's go back to that. Cases of polio. Poll came out after they announced Afghanistan, Pakistan. The reason is? Migration. No. Well, migration would be one of the factors. In the world, be, uh, okay. In the what event in the world changed global health? 
recently. Who was the most famous person in the world that was being hunted? Very good. Osama bin Laden. How did how was he found? Who found him? Who found him? A medical doctor vaccinating the villages who was an informant. That is the reason why when we now have vaccination programs in Pakistan and Afghanistan, what happens to the health workers? They are killed. They are shot and killed because they think that polio vaccine is an American uh, weapon that vaccinating will be influencing the minds of the children and actually they're gathering information. So who, want to, who would want to be vaccinated with such? So the finding of Osama bin Laden changed the polio vaccination and the war started to, come, to bring up again the polio cases. So what I'm trying to, to tell you is the global dynamics of conflict, war, economics, social and cultural determinants affect what is the end goal of every global health? The health outcome. Whether it's polio, or tuberculosis, or HIV AIDS. Now, as I said, the goal of this course is for you to be a critical thinker on how to relate global dynamics to local realities. Okay, this is what we had earlier. Um, I'm sure you know um, the, term, the three transitions. You have the epidemiologic transition. What is epidemiologic transition? Longer lives, uh, longer lives, therefore increases NCDs. And there will be an increase in, supposedly from infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases. So that's uh, epidemiologic transition. Here we have the demographic transition. You have a decreasing birth rate. People are not interested to have children. Death rate increases because of one phenomenon. But why is population increasing? Five-point essay question. Again, birth rate decreases. Death rate decreases. Population increases. So are we getting aliens from outer space? Or come to Earth? Because the death rate is decreasing, so the quality of uh, life is increased. So we're talking here of quality, we're just talking here of time. Time is increased, yes. So. They are living longer, so therefore population would increase. Again, there will be a rise of NCDs, so geriatric doctors would be good specialists during this time for critical care. So you'll be needed in on this year. So that is demographic trans transition. Again, translating to um, to pharma, college, uh, to um, medicines and drugs, NCDs will rise again. So the same thing as you notice: increase of cancers, increase of heart diseases, strokes, all NCDs. This HIV AIDS. This is just an unusual case, and other infectious diseases are actually going down. So therefore, it's not lucrative to be investing much in infectious diseases. That's the reason we are not pushing the companies to come up with HIV AIDS vaccines. So what, what did they come up with? Let's, no, we don't have a vaccine yet, so what should we do? What did, that, what did Bill Gates fund? What intervention? To bring down HIV cases in Africa, did they find? Not medicine. What? What do you do in the Philippines with the boys? <coughs> what? Condom? No, condom has been there for a long time. Circumcision. They say that circumcision will bring down the, the, the rate of infection to 70%. But get what the health promotion says. Get circumcised, you don't get HIV. 
You also get HIV and still unprotected sex. Obviously. So there's something wrong with the health promotion. So circumcision, they say, you know what circumcision is? So you got a preface. Why does circumcision not transfer the virus? Magic. You just cut it. You might just as well cut everything so that there will be no sex. Period. No HIV. Why not circumcision? <laughs> now you're awake. Okay. It's not part of the lesson because circumcision is not pharma. Let's just go to drugs. <laughs> I'll just answer that question later. Oh, who is the major producer of condom in the world? What country? China. <laughs> Does China produce rubber? No. Where is rubber from? Tropical areas. Tropical areas. Malaysia. You didn't know? You go home as souvenir, bring lots of condoms from Malaysia. Okay. <laughs> Let's just wind up the how epidemi global epidemiology. So, <clears throat> let us look at the differences. 100 boys from Japan. They live, live, live at this age and they die at a latter age. UK, they live long, then they die at a latter age. India, there's a drop. That means they die at what age? Five. Why is one of the why is under five and infancy are important measures of health in any country? Why is this part very important? So if this there's a lot of death here, there's something wrong with your health system. Vaccination is one of them. So that means there's something wrong with your health system because babies should not be dying. Because the baby is critical, right? During their growth. So if there's a dip, that means it dies, then there's something wrong with your health system. Either it's a maternal, a child health, and so on and so forth. But in Sierra Leone, the drop is very drastic. So that means the health system is not working at all. And then Zimbabwe, there's a drop here at this age. Why? At this age, 35 to 30. Because of war. So this is how you study global health trends on this thing. And you can make a lot of predictions. And that's what you do in your research. Okay, tobacco factors. Middle and low income countries, the death is higher among smokers as compared to the high income countries. Give me the reason. Why are there more people dying with smoking among the poorer countries than the rich countries? Because cigarettes in the richer countries are less toxic than in the poor countries? Because the cigarette is expensive, so you will not die? In rich countries, the people will not and they will go for alternatives. Are you sure? People in rich countries do not smoke? Because it's highly taxed. You are right. Taxation policy would lower the smoking as compared to the other countries. So here, the policies of smoking is not very strict. So the laws and regulations. And the, in most countries under 18 are not allowed, and low middle countries, so under 18, and these kids, they also smoke, so they get infected with it. Yes. Okay, my next question. We all know as a world that smoking is bad. We all know that it has a direct carcinogenic effect. It's already based on research and evidence. Why are people still smoking? Addiction. This is always a typical research. Um, why do people smoke? Why do students smoke? Fashion. What? Fashion, because it's shown on television. Is it because of that? Stressful life? Why do people, when they go to the toilet, they smoke there? It's so stressful to be in the toilet. 
No, so put away the smell. <laughs> it's because of the lobby of the tobacco companies. We can never eradicate smoking. Because the tobacco companies are always very, very strong. If you kill it, you're dead. No one will support your, um, your programs. No one will support the government programs because they're a major donor. The more that you tax them, actually people will still buy no matter what. That is the reason why there's a separation in some countries while not related to smoking about drug policy. What do you give? What do you give? What treatment do you give to people who are, who are drug addicts? What is the treatment for addiction? We already discussed earlier. What do you give to the poor so that they will not be poor? We give them cash. Whether you like it or not. You agree that you give cash to poor so that they will improve their lives? Yes. How do you call that? How do you call that program when you give cash to people? It's a conditional cash transfer. Give cash, cash as in cash to the poor. Because if you give them cash, they will buy food, they will buy medicine, they will bring their children to school. Conditional because there's a condition. No more children. Then I'll give you cash every. And it works based on, on, on studies. So that's why it's not being done in the World Bank. Now, if there's a drug patient, what will you give to the patient? Logic. I already gave you an example. Antidote. Antidote. Give a venom. Antidote. Drugs. What kind of drug? Like who is the hell is this global health thought leader who tells people to give cash to give drugs? That's exactly what Europe is doing. You give drugs to the addicts. That's the methadone treatment. Where do you give the drugs? To the patients. In what? No! On the street, that's where they are. Why will you go to the? You think they will go to the rehabilitation center? No, they will just go to the corner in the dark alley. Give the drugs there every day. Don't fail, huh? Every day, give them drugs. How do you give them drugs? Okay, this guy is crazy teaching us many things. You give methadone like how you do it with tuberculosis in front of the patient directly observed there are only well this is not a fact two diseases or problems where you directly observe dots tb and drugs why do you have to give drugs in front of the patient to make sure that he takes a drug because he's a drug addict correct yes if you give it in packets, what will they do with it? Sell. Then your program will not be effective. And you taper down the dose until you wean the patient from the addiction. It's different from dots because dots you just finish the, the regimen. So that's only done in countries who believe the drug addiction is not based on social uh, determinants but on genetic. So some people are already prone to addiction. Now to separate the drug policy, you separate soft drugs from hard drugs. Soft are marijuana and those kind of things. You allow them, like in the Netherlands, in European countries. But you separate the heroin. Because if you allow the people to do it, then you can easily see and control them. So if you go to the Netherlands, for example, how do you know that they are selling the best, you know, Amsterdam? Amsterdam is an interesting city. They allow abortion, they allow sex work, prostitution, they allow drugs, now they allow, allow euthanasia, they just allow everything. Aside from same-sex marriage, they allow everything. How do you know that the best drug you're buying is, is the marijuana you're buying is uh, authentic? You know marijuana? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, don't be shy, you know it. You're a pharmacist. <laughs> How do you know that, that it's a real thing that you buy in a... You go to what you call a coffee shop. It's not Starbucks. When you go to a coffee shop, they sell marijuana, not coffee. That's the name, huh? Coffee shop, don't enter if you're not. How do you know that it's the real drug? The real marijuana? They have a microscope. Because you have a menu, you'll be given a menu. Which one, which marijuana do you want? It's from Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Nepal. They have all sources. Or homemade. Okay? There are many kinds of varieties. And then they have a microscope on the side. Like, wow, they're intellectual here. Intellectual <laughs> addicts. What is a microscope for? Let's see how we teach uh, drug addiction among the farmers. What's the active ingredient of marijuana? THC. Very good. Check. 100 points. Where do you get tetrahydrocannabinol? From the leaves or from the flowers? I know you're not smokers here, but you can try. So leaves. Wrong. You're smoking the wrong part of the plant. <laughs> it's the flower. Stop buying the wrong thing. <laughs> it's the flower. So you check the flower. Those are the dried ones that look like leaves. And then you check the crystals. The more crystals, the more expensive it is. Don't smoke the leaves. It has no effect. Okay? That's why you're a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, now let's, uh, let's just introduce a uh, surface um, <clears throat> part of global epidemiology, how it translates to pharma policies and pharma issues. There's more detail on this. You'll get many parts of the slides, but I hope at least now you know how you would explain to your students on how you put in all the different factors and relate it to the individual factors. So I end my session for this day. We'll have two other lecturers who will introduce themselves, and I will see you for the workshop tomorrow. Thank you very much.